morning. Welcome, everyone. Welcome also those in the back. So we have many seats around the table. Please, if you want to join, it will make it easier for us to have an interesting conversation. Uh, we have 60 minutes, so uh, I think it's enough. They can do very good television programs in six minutes, so we don't have any reasons for not doing a good debate in 60 minutes. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to this UNESCO Open Forum, uh, formulating policy options for big data and AI development, um, based on a concrete text that will be presented to you today, launching, UNESCO is launching in this very moment. Uh, it's called Steering AI and Advanced ICTs for Knowledge Societies. Many of the peer reviewers and contributors for this publication are here. So it's very interesting that we do this kind of debates based on a concrete previous background document, which is the case uh, for this publication. We also have authors and contributors to others, uh, other series of reports of UNESCO connected to this issue. So I think we will have an interesting kickoff. And then, of course, the idea is that all of you can contribute to this central question that is how we can enhance and foster policy. Uh, you will see that uh, my colleagues who prepared this are very ambitious uh, with the questions. Of course, we will need an entire year to discuss the questions. But if we can input, uh, offer some inputs to this idea of building policy, I think we will have achieved an interesting result for the, for the reports and keep building on this knowledge later on, because this debate will sure continue in other moments. So now, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, Cedric Bolshovitz, uh, who is uh, the head of UNESCO delegation here in this IGF, but also the head of our area on ICTs uh, and the connection with several UNESCO mandate areas in at all our headquarters. All the speakers, by the way, have very, very interesting CVs. And in order of saving time, I'm not going to read all of them, but I will ask you a specific question so you can start thinking to describe yourselves in no more than seven words. So, Cedric, you have the challenge first. Thank you so much, uh, Guillermo. Uh, so I had the ICTs in education, science, and culture section. Well, that's seven words. <laughs> uh, and I, I thank you for your introductions. I w extend a very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of the Assistant Director General for Communication and Information, Mr. Moes Chakchuk, who who cannot be with us today, um, as we have in UNESCO the general conference meeting, which is, uh, decides on programs and budgets, meets every two years. And uh, they, uh, it's an important week because actually um, one of the commissions last Thursday decided, and that's directly relating to our work here, to have to develop a standard setting instrument on uh, ethics and AI. Uh, human rights-based, uh, human-centered um, ethical uh, recommendation. And that will be a process um, which will be with a plenary decision this week, uh, this week uh, will be launched and will take two years and it will be a very inclusive um, process. So uh, this is why also our Assistant Director General could not be with us today, but it is of course directly related and, and we're very happy about this. Ladies and gentlemen, one aspect of what makes human is that we can think about alternative futures and make deliberate choices. In the past few years, we have realized the disruptive potentials of artificial intelligence, including in the fields of education, sciences, culture, media, access to information, gender equality, and poverty alleviation. Even as there is a broad consensus that AI is being used to transform different spheres of human activity, we remain in a state of flux when it comes to understanding the influence of this transformation on individuals and societies. We have brought with us today some leaflets, you will find them here, um, which are teasers to the report we will launch uh, in a few weeks. Uh, and which benefited already from the review uh, by some of the panelists here uh, with us. 
This report recognizes that AI is an opportunity to achieve the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals through its contribution to building what UNESCO calls inclusive knowledge societies. These are inclusive societies based upon free expression, access to information, quality education, and respect for cultural and linguistic diversity. To steer AI accordingly, we need to recognize the uneven but dynamic distribution of AI power across multiple and dispersed centers within government, private sector, technical community, civil society, and other stakeholders worldwide. It is for this reason that multi-stakeholder engagement around AI, like the one we have gathered here today, is vital. Based on UNESCO's Internet Universality Rome framework, agreed by our member states in 2015, this study analyzes how AI and advanced ICTs will impact human rights, the R of the Rome framework, in terms of freedom of expression, privacy, media, journalism, and non-discrimination, how openness needs to inform the technical and safety challenges related to AI, how access to AI hinges upon access to algorithm, hardware, human resources and data, and how a multi-stakeholder approach concerning AI governance can address the challenges and opportunities for the benefit of humanity. In addition, it addresses the challenges of AI for gender equality and Africa, two global priorities of UNESCO. The report, which will be launched very soon, offers a set of policy options that can serve as inspiration for the de development of a new policy framework and for re-examination of existing policies. I sincerely hope that this report will assist member states and all other stakeholders in understanding the transitions underway in our societies and help steer AI for creating inclusive knowledge societies. I hope we'll have a fruitful discussion today and thank you. Thank you so much, Cedric. So some key words of Cedric's opening remarks. The idea that UNESCO is a standard setting organization and it's coming a new mandate of the General Conference on this issue. So during our debates, let's remember that. What is, this, what is setting standards on this area? The idea that we are an organization uh, uh, that can be called a laboratory of ideas. So what new ideas should come from this discussion? But also very important to underline uh, the importance of building human rights, open, accessible, and most stakeholder-based policies towards these issues. That is in, within this Internet Universality Rome concept that was also approved by our General Conference. Thanks a lot, Cedric. I think it helped uh, to set the stage for the next speaker, uh, Ms. Shang Hong, who is going to present uh, the study in uh, incredible eight minutes, but you also have your seven words to present yourself. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Guilherme. Thank you, Cedric, for the nice introduction. Uh, seven words about me. I think I, uh, I am an advocate of Rome principles. Um, uh, you know, it, this is a research uh, which we have conducted for one year involving a research team of uh, six uh, colleagues. Uh, unfortunately, the rest part of the team are not here. I just want to send a remote thanks to them. And also we have several reviewers here. Uh, we have gone through a global peer review, including um, 20 international experts with two uh, representatives here. So that's really great. And you know, it's a 200 page book. Um, I have condensed into a 16 slice and Guilherme gave me eight minutes. I think I need the help of AI to finish this job. So I will be very brief to unpack some major issues we have tackled, but without giving a precise example and the details. Um, since uh, day zero to now, we have heard um, so many discussions, research reports about uh, artificial intelligence. What is special about uh, this UNESCO research? 
I have listened to all kinds of, I mean, uh, utopianism and uh, dystopianism. So this research is special because it's trying to combine both positive and negative aspects to fully explore the tre tremendous potentials and opportunities of AI to help with the sustainable development and advancing human rights. And also, we try to examine the potential risks and the challenges while we are harnessing this uh, powerful technology. And so, as Cedric just uh, framed very well, the second special feature of this book is that we are using UNESCO Rome framework to look at um, how AI is impacting different uh, rights, how the situation of openness is evident in the development of AI, what's the challenge and the potentials for the uh, inclusive of access to developing AI, and uh, also how we operationalize multi-stakeholder approach in governing the AI. And as a UNESCO contribution to the global discussion, we have highlighted two cross-cutting issues. One is how AI can help us to fight for gender equality, and also how we can use AI to empower Africa and the developing country. Uh, if you have been to our day zero event of UNESCO on the Internet Universality Indicators, you must have also heard that, uh, uh, sorry, let me go back again. Uh, we, are, we have developed 303 indicators to measure this Romex uh, at the national level. We already have uh, uh, 12 countries assessment. That assessment uh, would be very conducive to AI development as this research has recommended, because AI needs to have a very robust internet environment in place to support this sophisticated technology to, to develop in the country. So on human rights, for UNESCO, we have uh, identified four uh, crucial areas, freedom expression, access to information, no doubt they are being expanded by the artificial intelligence, but at the same time, we see a worrying trend that uh, the increasing online moderation to remove uh, hatred speech, remove violence, etc., can re risk uh, removing the legitimate uh, um, speech if there are no uh, due process in place. And um, artificial intelligence is also contributing uh, dissemination and amplification of disinformation uh, while it's helping us to access um, boundless information at the same time. And right to privacy is another crucial right at stake. The, the AI can de-anonymize de the data which means nowadays no data can be completely personal. And uh, the facial uh, recognition is being widely used by many countries in public space. Uh, privacy is something we need more assessment. And journalism and the media development, we have uh, identified in the research quite some good examples that um, journalists are really benefiting from the AI technology to help them uh, scanning millions of records to the investigative journalism and uh, to save that time and energy to produce good report. And, um, but on the other hand, they, uh, we also see a trend that uh, digital attacks against the journalists uh, can also be automated by AI in a, in a more uh, threatening manner. Um, last one uh, is about the uh, right to equality. We have to face such a fact. Uh, it's never easy to eliminate, uh, eliminate the bias embedded in the data and also, and also uh, the automated decision-making process. So the challenge to, uh, to, to ensure the fairness in decision will be, a, will be crucial. And uh, we also observe that <clears throat> the challenge of uh, AI in 
influencing voters' opinion, voter decision-making process uh, in the elections. I believe our colleague Robert will <laughs> dig it more. And uh, such a cruel decision from the, from the uh, moderate. I have only two minutes, so I just uh, will be super, super quick like uh, AI. Um, so we have the multi-stakeholder recommendations for uh, different uh, stakeholders. And uh, particularly, we include the media, who is going to play a, a equally important role. And then on openness, we tackle the issues of black box, uh, open data, um, uh, the, the, the monopolization of the markets, and we provided the recommendations and the actions. Access is a map the divide along the AI development within the countries and also among the countries. Uh, recommendations and then they um, that's because such an uneven development of AI among the countries among within the countries uh, more than ever as in the internet governance we see the more than ever a need for more inclusive multi-stakeholder participation to govern the AI recommendations and uh, the gender Again, I, I must say that uh, we need to uh, have AI as allies to help us to achieve better gender quality, quality. But we also recognize there is a huge dominance of men in the AI development uh, uh, industry, and also uh, such a uh, ubiquitous existence of algorithm discrimination against the women. For Africa, Africa is not uh, only lagging behind in developing the AI at the level of capacity in structure and governance, but also since AI industry needs to use global data to train its algorithm and the machine, uh, African can, vict uh, can be a victim by selling its personal data of citizens to the internet companies, AI companies, that can jeopardize the privacy of our African people. Um, I more or less stop here. Um, is that already two minutes? Um, I, uh, we are having this leaflet in the room, and we still have a few copies. And the, the full report, 200-page break, will be on UNESCO website in the following weeks. And uh, I'm still here around till tomorrow morning, and feel free to talk to me if we need more information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shen Hong. So this is uh, when you go to those restaurants with uh, very long menus, and you do give a first look in eight minutes. So now we are going to start which kind of food we are going to pick up to discuss, but a few elements. 2030 is just around the corner, so how this discussion on AI and policy can really help to achieve all the 17 goals of the 2030 agenda. Then the crucial issues related to human rights, and many of you might be thinking, of course, but we have such huge challenges for health, for labor, for other key human rights. But let's not forget that freedom of expression and access to information are enablers for achieving the other rights uh, more than rights in itself, which is also true. So how the impact of NI in freedom of expression, access to information is related across the border to all the other SDGs and human rights. And of course, the gender perspective is, is very, very relevant. So let's think the different groups here in the recommendations that are in the report for each stakeholder, civil society, media, governments, academics, how we can improve the discussion in those different areas. So now we are going to the discussion phase with very, very interesting speakers who were invited to uh, debate uh, this issue, what Chang Hong just said, and also their own inputs to this. And we will start with Mr. Alex Cominus, who has uh, five minutes and seven words to describe yourself. Uh, hi, I'm Alex Cominus. Uh, in seven words, I would say I'm an a, well, I'm an ICT policy researcher. I put a forward slash, so I'm an AI forward slash ICT policy researcher. Um, sure, I'm an AI slash ICT policy researcher. Um, so I've been researching ICT policy for, for quite some time. There is an overlap between the two, and I think we're gonna discuss that, that later. 
I work for an organization called Research ICT Africa. We look at ICT access usage um, and evidence-based policy in Africa. And AI for us is, is ICT. Um, and uh, although AI is 60, 60 years old, uh, in a way um, it's not new, but in a way it's, um, it's prevalence in our computing lives, like everywhere. You navigated on Google Maps or, or, sorry, you navigated on a map application or used one of the various transport applications to get here. Your newsfeed was curated by algorithms or AI-based systems. Uh, your photos were maybe cleaned up when sent back to family. Um, uh, and yeah, all sorts of perhaps uh, artificial intelligence as well in the, in the efficiency of, of, of the, the, the lights or, or the electronic systems to get here. So uh, yeah, AI is, is new and it's, it's in that way that it's very prevalent. Um, and it affects our core rights in that sense. So your right to uh, freedom, or access to information uh, is, is somewhat mediated by AI because it, it acts as a filter selecting the news that, that, you, that you get. Um, if you live in countries with, uh, or in a situation where there's uh, violence or ethnic conflict, your, your right to safety and security will also somehow intersect, well, the AI algorithm will also somehow intersect with this if, if fake news is going to cause conflicts in communities. So we, there's a, to addressing the human rights concerns, I would say you know, all human rights are affected by AI. And um, so a, an approach that's, that's quite big now is, is AI ethics. And um, I think the Rome framework is a lot better rights, openness, access, multi-stakeholderism, and, and the cross-cutting issues, because we've had human rights law for a very long time. Um, we uh, yeah, have had practice in, in being open societies through the internet and, and at that, through Rome principles. Uh, yeah, multi-stakeholderism, we are sitting in a living example of it. Um, but the, the ethics discourse, I think there's a, a tendency that the early actors or the disruptors or specifically the corporate sector can, can set an agenda there. Um, so I think in order to be inclusive, we do have to think about the new ethics of AI, but we also have to think about human rights law, convention, et cetera. Um, so the issues around AI, which I think we're going to discuss in the session, are, are obviously that, that algorithms are affecting decision making. Uh, there's automated decision making. There's algorithmic assisted decision making. Um, and yeah, we can make that uh, more diverse and we can address bias within that. But uh, we, yeah, we can't just look at the algorithm, we have to look at, at, at how the, the um, we, you know, how, the, what is the application? What are you actually doing with the technology involved or the application involved? And then lastly, I think all new technologies have tended to uh, yeah, uh, increase digital inequalities. So, so as more people um, come online or, or as, as, as the internet rolls out, um, quality of access becomes an issue. Um, uh, many people are online, but they, 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 they do not have you know, adequate computing devices in order to take advantage of being in a knowledge society. So we also really have to watch out that AI is not creating new digital inequalities. And uh, my other concern about talking about ICT for development and the digital divide. Uh, we've been doing this for, for, for decades. So um, it's, we don't want attention deflected away from it. And I think my time is up. Yeah, thank you very much. Right on time, thanks a lot. So a few uh, flags from, from, from Langlet's uh, remarks rights mediated by algorithms, so let's think about that, and how to include 
ethical considerations and again human rights law considerations in the decision making process of building uh, AI technology but also the policies related to this area and he finished talking about a very in, other important element for the 2030 agenda that is the idea of leaving no one behind. So how we stop increasing inequalities when we are building and implementing uh, these technologies and the policy related to them. So now we are going to move to Ms. Sai Vipra. Hope I have pronounced it correctly. You know, the multilingualism is also part of this challenge. So you have five minutes and seven words to describe yourself. Thank you, I'm Zai. Uh, in seven words, I'm a researcher and advocate for the democratization of technology. I'm from an organization called IT for Change in India. And I really have to congratulate you for this report because it situates the question of human rights in the larger global political economy. And I think in that respect, it's almost unique among the reams and reams of AI reports that we see coming out every month. And um, I want to talk about some of the principles you've outlined. I will also present some examples to illustrate how those principles might actually work in uh, the research that we've seen till now. So in terms of rights and the right to equality, I want to talk about the use of AI in education. And a lot of AI solutions are sold in education to say that um, you can now give personalized learning to your children. Uh, but we see that it is also a method of reducing the spending on education, reducing public spending on education, and increasing the privatization of education. So you're almost in a situation where human contact is for the rich kids, and everyone else gets to be taught by a computer. So we have to think about the right to equality in that way. Uh, also, we've done some work in terms of automation and the use of AI in the ports and logistics sector. Uh, we know in India, and we know that AI over there is used to track how the workers drive and uh, the truck drivers drive along the ports and track every single moment of their lives. So it's about worker surveillance. It's about not being able to take a bathroom break. It's about the computer not even telling you two steps in front about what you're supposed to do. And so these are the important questions that we think can be solved by reclaiming standard setting as a public function, which I think also is a part of the report where UNESCO and other public bodies um, are now thinking that we have left the setting of standards for far too long to the private sector. Then I want to talk about openness, and I'm really happy that you've talked about open and pluralistic markets and open data sets, because both of these together, because we've seen that there's a demand for um, open data for government data and data that is publicly collected, but also simultaneously a demand for the exclusive control of data by the technology giants. And uh, this is a situation that doesn't make sense, and I'm glad that you've asked for open data sets in general as well, and for data commons uh, under the next principle of access. Um, data commons, we think, would be extremely useful for the people to determine what they want to do with their own data in a collective way, in a democratic way, because there is a lot of data that is not personal data. There's a lot of data that is not merely behavioral. There's, for example, soil data, things like that, that need to be used in uh, under a commons framework. Uh, through proper governance channels. And uh, this, for example, in agriculture would be extremely useful because we've seen that AI and big data is used in agriculture primarily for business process um, reorganization, for speculation on agri-commodity futures, but not for things like predicting droughts, for predicting where, uh, what crops you should grow for the individual farmer. And so we think if Th these data sets and the algorithms on top of those could be used more democratically, you would be solving better problems and problems that uh, make more sense to the people. And so uh, one of the questions that was asked to the panel is how do we actually regulate 
artificial intelligence, how do we make sure there is no bias? And of course, there are problems with existing training data sets. Um, there are problems with the inputs, but there are many ways to regulate the outputs of uh, algorithms. You can have minimum standards. You can uh, ask for you can ask for transparency of uh, the algorithms. Uh, which is not always possible, but through minimum transparency, you can also reverse engineer some of the things that are happening. And we think it's important for governments to not sign away their rights to have access to source codes, given these facts, uh, through international trade agreements especially. And so I'd like to end, because my time is getting over, by saying that uh, I really like the fact that you've talked about how technological determinism is not the way to go anymore, and we're realizing how things are changing, and that it is important for people to determine their own technological future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so highlights on education, SDG4, the, relations, the complex relationship with private sector, not only here in education, but also private sector as a standard setter on this area, issue of surveillance, open data and uh, data commons as a public good and how we can regulate that to be effective and protective of human rights. So if I understood you correct, in 30 seconds, a uh, few remarks on what you just said. So now we are going to our next speaker that will offer a complementary view to this discussion, Professor Robert Krimer. You have five minutes and your seven words. Thank you. Thank you again, Graham. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for being here and for actually having me here in this room. It's good to see uh, former colleagues and uh, friends here amongst the participants, so it's uh, very nice to be speaking here. I'm also speaking on behalf of my two co-authors, Armin uh, Rabic and Rasto Kutzel, uh, as we are commissioned to edit a paper. So maybe we can put my slides on quickly. Yeah, okay, great. So where we are working on the intersection between elections and using new technologies such as AI, uh, a guide that we have been uh, commissioned to go forward with by UNESCO and UNDP. So what we're actually dealing with is being former election observers or also active election observers, we are committed to actually providing for or observing for a, a context that provides for genuine elections. However, we see that new technologies actually undermine that and uh, basically lead to voting under influence. And this influence can manifest either in deceptive claims about candidates, AI using uh, different kinds of videos, as we heard already before about deep, deep fakes, or we hear about misleading messages that are being put forward in social media, or even we hear about voter suppression, so actually leading to information that brings people to keep away from elections. And all of those effects uh, actually undermine our elections and the way that we are uh, going forward. So the guide that we have been commissioned is to provide election practitioners, whether they are in official function or unofficial as a stakeholder in the election, to get insights and understandings of how technology uh, can influence election, how to counter that, and how to overcome those barriers to a genuine election. No, sorry, that was the wrong... Button. We are actually also building up on the media and elections guide that has been previously published by UNESCO and we're also taking it up and complement it with our undertaking that is already working towards EMBs, media, uh, international election assistance providers, civil society organizations, but also internet service providers. So you see this holistic approach that is also driven or driving this internet governance forum. And so we're very committed to also include that in our uh, guidebook that we are working on. So how do we actually do it? We have established an expert advisory group of some 25 members that are well represented across the board. So not only white males from Europe, but actually having the whole world represented. That was very important, in particular to UNESCO, to have that included. We will have an online discussion where we'll have all the paragraphs of our some 150 pages uh, guidebook where we'll discuss it and we'll deliberate. So we're also using technology to ensure that we have a consensus-based approach in our handbook. So 
what are we actually uh, working on? So on one side, we work on this intersection on internet, social media, and AI. We're working on international standards and regional commitments that guide the providing for a genuine uh, environment for elections. We're looking at these emerging issues around AI, around social media, and actually the use of the internet. And we actually show which role the election practitioners can play in uh, tackling the emerging issues. And last but not least, we will give recommendation to stakeholders on the way forward in dealing with the internet. And with that, I'm already about to close. And uh, I will just say, like, we're looking forward to any comments that you might have or pointers that you would like us to include in the paper and here are our emails. And thank you very much for giving us the time. And we're looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, again, uh, a key element here is the impact of all of this in a core element of our representative democracies, our elections. And it's very interesting that uh, electoral observers' missions now are, for instance, in Latin America, included a special rapporteur on freedom of expression in the missions that was not the case for many years. And that's because this issue is more and more related to the correct development or incorrect development of elections. So thank you so much. And I think this is uh, definitely another element we should bring to our discussions when we open the floor uh, to all of us in this room. Now, uh, I'm going to hand the floor to Ms. Izzy Fer Ferrandes, uh, who will have five minutes and your seven words to present yourself. Um, my seven words would be Teens in AI Ambassador and youth perspective. So I got into AI when, last summer, actually, as I went to an accelerator of two weeks where we had to develop a product in line with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, I went for climate change, as I feel quite passionately about that. And we made a web extension that takes your, what you buy normally every week and gives you alternatives that are more ethical, eco-friendly. So, after I left the accelerator and went back to school, I realized that what I was taught there was really different to what we were being taught at school. And I realized that we need to make changes. As obviously the AI is in the future, it will be my future, my generation's future. And well, we need to start teaching ethics and AI in school, computational thinking to younger children so that they can go into the workplace tech literate and understanding what they're doing. Um, I also looked at democracy, obviously I can't vote yet, but I really hope that when I can, we've made sure that voting under the influence isn't a thing anymore, that I can understand that the news I'm getting from, me, from social media is true, it's not made up, it's not a deep fake, it's what's really happening in our world. Um, also, I'm hoping that if we educate young people on AI, on ethics, that this will enable social mobility for everyone so they can go from school and they will have more access to these things. They'll be able to say, I understand what's happening in the technology industry and hopefully that will make big changes in our future. Thank you, that was a very good... That was a very good summary. Uh, you saved us also minutes for the discussion, but I would like uh, to, to, to underline this very last point on the relevance of media and information literacy uh, in this discussion, that it's not only for children and young people, it's for all of us. We all need to learn more uh, how to navigate in this, in this new ocean. And also, Izzy uh, underlined in the very beginning uh, of, of her remarks, the relationship with another important set of SDGs that are the, those related to uh, environment and sustainable development, uh, so climate change, water, uh, ecosystems, uh, life on land, etc. cetera. So uh, thank you very much for pointing out also those uh, new elements for this discussion. Now, last but not least, our final speaker in this round of uh, initial remarks, and I will ask Shang Hong, since we have the privilege of having a Chinese speaking among our, my colleagues, to pronounce correctly the name of um, our next speaker. Uh, uh, Thank you. So you have five minutes and seven words to describe yourself. Uh, 
thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm glad to be here, and uh, I found it's uh, it's broad, and I actually prepared something, but I want to say something else. So I'm thinking, why uh, we we are here? Because we are people from different backgrounds. Why are we here? Because I think we recognize that AI is not a tech, just a technology. It's not just one industry. It's something that is far-reaching. It's not only just. A, so we are thinking that in the past, it some could be called Internet Plus. But in the future, does AI bring us to an intelligent society? Is that AI Plus? So I think this is a good chance that we have some mind storming. It's very important to see some strategy, we, what, we are, what we are facing. So actually, uh, uh, I'm glad that we are noticed that importance. And yesterday, I think with the OECD panel, we talked about the principle of AI. I think something very similar, like uh, reliable and agile and responsible and something like this. Especially, I think we all agree that it should be human-centric. I think everybody agrees. And so I think it calls for the importance. And second, I think AI, we are talking about a lot of risk management, but also development is very important because we see that in the new economy, it's very important for the economic development that AI is a core power of digital economy, which is the main part of the new economy. So development is unavailable. So actually we can do from different fields, especially at like, for example, for the government, like Chinese government, I think at least they do three things. The first is that it use AI to help the livelihood, to reduce poverty, to help the education and medical care. And second, that it use AI to one-stop service. We have mobile service, smartphones, I nearly uh, do all my text, everything on the, uh, use my smartphone, and uh, but help the things easier for business and for individuals. And third, that it should uh, call for open data and make a healthy ecosystem. So uh, I think development is important and the government could sum something and everybody else. And third, I think it's time for us to call for cross-border international cooperation is very important, not just one industry. Especially we should rethink the role of machine and people. And we also, I'm glad to see that we have young children, we have a child here, and it's, it's, the time is for them, not, not just for us. Because it's young generation, the most active actor in cyberspace, and we should pay attention to what's happening and their thoughts and what's happening in the future. But the summary, I think that's for call for something value like tech for social goods. That's something very common. And thank you. Thank you very much. And we talked in the, uh, in, in, during the previous panelists on lots of human rights, social elements of the 2030 agenda, uh, now also the, the environmental elements. But now it was important to raise as well uh, the economical and uh, economic development and digital economy elements of, uh, of this. And of obviously, needless to say, AI uh, has a lot to play in this area as well. So thank you so much. And Due to the kindness and sharp time of my, all my speakers, we, we have 17 minutes for discussion. This is a luxury in these meetings in IGF, so I hope you all uh, take advantage of this opportunity uh, to raise your questions, concerns, comments, uh, if possible, briefly, so that we have space for, my, for more people. So let's collect uh, a first set of questions, comments, and then back uh, if the panelists want to comment on that, and if we have time, another set. Uh, if people want to send uh, written comments, our colleagues here can help with them, but you are free to use the mics as well. So who wants to break the ice? Please, sir, identify yourself. Uh, I'm Anupam Guha. Um, I'm a faculty at Center for Policy Studies at IIT Bombay, and I work on AI policy. Um, my question is something specific. Uh, it's, uh, it's in the Indian scenario, but it has also been observed in certain um, American and European jurisdictions that we often have this curious case where AI development and code is preceding policy. Certain AI artifacts get made, they inundate the market, 
they approach governmental and policymaker uh, in various forms, and then they get implemented, and then policy comes later to sort of uh, sort of explain the usage of these artifacts. One uh, famous one is, of course, uh, uh, facial recognition technology. And I'm not talking about the privacy and other well-discussed uh, aspects of facial res uh, recognition technology. One aspect which doesn't get talked about much is that it is causing a policy function creep in which you have um, it to be used, like it is being used in certain places where you see law enforcement officials essentially saying that it was not us who is responsible for certain decisions, it was this uh, artifact which told us so. So this is very much, I think, a human rights issue as well, aside from being a policy issue. Uh, certain jurisdictions have responded to this by abolishing certain collections of data, abolishing certain AI artifacts. FRT has been made illegal in certain jurisdictions. I would like to hear the thoughts of the panel when it comes to this uh, specific problem of techno-solutionism and capitalism sort of entering into the policy sphere and sort of leading policy development rather than the other way around. Thank you. Thank you so much. Here we had a question. Hello. My name is Kosi Amesinu. I'm from Benin. I work for African ICT Foundation. My question is to know, we are talking on the literature that uh, intelligent artificial have one key of action is surveillance. Is this true or false? Thank you. There. My name is uh, Ayo Bangera. I'm a MP from DRC. And uh, my thinking is to ask about uh, uh, what's, the, what's the limit we can put on AI? Because you know, sometimes we tend to give the priority to the machine to decide. But sometimes machine and human can be in conflict. And we can, in, in some, like an, an example, in some airlines company, for landing and land off, they tend to give the priority to the automatic pilot because the assurance company cannot afford, that's an instruction from some assurance company that to assure you, we have to take uh, the landing and land off by the automatic uh, pilot. So when there's a conflict between human and machine, I think we should also give the priority to the human a decision that that can should be uh, some of our our fight within a, a, U, a UNESCO. And another thing, I saw it in the document, uh, the problem of our African country. We, we are not yet on the, on the road to get access to AI and big data, but we are having most of the internet users. In a few years, Africa users will be more than uh, uh, America and Europe combined. So the data will be coming from our continent, but we are not able to access it. We, I think in the Rome a document is very specified. Uh, I saw it that uh, we should also give some right to access data, local data, to our uh, research, to our company. We are not yet uh, ready to do that, but at least to, to have that option that our data, we, which are stored in the US, we should be able, the, the right to have it once our research and company are ready to use them, they should have that right. Another specification is on the internet in general, not only in AI, but on UNESCO side. Yeah, because this meeting is led by UNESCO. Uh, on the opening ceremony, uh, the Chancellor Aguilar Merkel say about uh, to have internet a world public good. Uh, that things we should see how to make, uh, we are, in our country we are facing pressure from uh, NGO and uh, uh, Europe, US, because we tend to shut down internet sometime. It's happened huh? when there is some trouble, election and what. That's we shut down against our people. But what will happen if uh, 
sometime a country uh, decide to shut down internet against another country. Like uh, now with the internet depend on the uh, US infrastructure. US can make a decision to shut down like a sanction. He has already put a sanction on uh, China to avoid them to use uh, Android. But in the future, he can just decide to shut down internet for a country. Uh, how can uh, the UNESCO protect that? How can, uh, my view is to, can we achieve to make internet a world public good as is done for world heritage site so internet became a world public good. Thanks. Thank you, MP. Uh, another question and then back to the panel. Thank you very much, uh, Rasta Kužel, uh, Memo 98 Slovakia. I also wanted to elaborate a little bit more on uh, the use of AI during elections. Uh, as it has already been mentioned that AI has been also used for dissemination of disinformation and this is currently one of the one of the biggest challenges. I mean, the, the spread of disinformation, which undermines the, the trust and credibility um, into the system, as well as uh, foreign interference uh, in elections. So, this is why uh, I think it's it's important to uh, continue developing. Uh, like you mentioned, that uh, in, in Latin America, uh, you know, there is more attention now paid to freedom of expression during elections. Other institutions such as uh, European Union, um, you know, OSC, OD, they are already deploying uh, election observers who are paying special attention uh, to, to social media use uh, during elections. So I think this is, it's, it's always important uh, when there is introduction of ICT uh, for elections that a certain group is not disadvantaged and, and, and that uh, you know, the, the, the overall use is not uh, done for, 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 for malign purposes, which then undermines uh, the trust uh, in the system. Thank you. So just to refresh the memory of the panelists, uh, obviously you don't need to reply all questions, each one of you. Perhaps let's pick some, some questions among, among you guys. But the first one was the time gap between uh, technology advancements and policy uh, development. Uh, the second one raised the issue of surveillance. Uh, then uh, we had different questions from, from the lawmaker here, and it's very important that in this IGF we have several congressmen, congresswomen, members of parliaments in different parts of the world because you are essential stakeholders in, in tackling this issue. So the limits of AI when there are conflicts of rights, then there, there was a question on data rights and sovereign, sovereign rights related to data and access to those data. That perhaps a question for Cedric on UNESCO view of internet as a public good and how to solve that. And, uh, and the final remark on the issue of the impacts of an overall use of ICTs during elections, not only fake news, if I can understand you correctly, but also elections that are using voting machi machines and things like that, and how we play this ball uh, in order to protect democracy. So who wants to start? We have seven minutes for, for some of those questions. Hong? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Guilherme, and thanks to all the excellent questions which gave me an opportunity to share more uh, findings from, from research. First, re re um, regarding the time uh, gap between the policy making regarding the AI and also the, the, the existing AI applications in the society. Uh, that's uh, something really one of the big challenges because the impact of this kind of AI product can be irreversible if it is harmful. That's why we are really calling a human rights mainstreaming strategy among all the stakeholders. Uh, saying that, which means human rights, they are they are the norm framework to influence, to shape the national policies. We are calling the national states to make sure they, all the regulations in place are conducive to the human rights, to conduct the assessment of the human rights when they assess a new product. Same equally apply to the private sector. The companies, shouldn't we, shouldn't they also, we shouldn't their terms of services, shouldn't their techni technology guidelines be 
gone through a, a human rights assessment before they put the put the product to market, before they develop this AI product, should have this uh, human rights check human rights check in place. Also for the technical community, we are uh, promoting human rights by design product for the AI applications. So I think human rights is not, not, not something in the air. It is something really substantial. Uh, all the uh, stakeholders need to stick to those internationally agreed agreements on human rights in developing AI at all levels. In terms of issue of surveillance, it is a reality in place. I mean, whether it's mass surveillance, I mean, used by many law enforcement in many countries, or the targeted surveillance used also by different public agencies in many countries, they are really influencing everyone. To what extent this AI-based data, massive data collection, are being collected in an opaque way, are being shared are they under a due process to third parties or fourth parties or multi parties? That's all questionable. That's why we are here to jointly develop a human rights based framework to make sure the mass surveillance or target surveillance, we, we need there to be legitimate surveillance to, on one hand, to protect the security uh, of the society, but on the other hand, without uh, compromising rights um, and the dignity of a human. Um, maybe I talked too much, but the last, last thing I want to mention is that um, crucial challenge of all this issue is that the lack of uh, transparency and accountable process to put in place to, to check all this development uh, stage of the AI at all levels. That's why uh, it's, uh, it's an urgent issue. That's why we should really keep this discussion and exploration and a di a dialogue as well as collaboration ongoing. Thank you. Thank you. So this, this very last point is ra highly important. We should uh, have more efforts and more thoughts on how to develop better uh, transparency and accountability mechanism for all of this. So, Cedric, perhaps you can offer some insights on the questions directly to UNESCO. Yeah, thank you, again. Of course, uh, for UNESCO, the Internet is a public good, and it is central uh, in terms of enhancing human rights and overcoming uh, the threats uh, related to human rights. Uh, we addressed um, a number, or I, I would like uh, a number of issues to address again, also through the framework we will be developing, because the questions raised where about accountability, about privacy, about human control of technology, about fairness and discrimination. And all these are categories which need to be addressed within a human rights-based, human-centered ethical framework. And of course, uh, it's not new that policy runs behind technology, and it will continue to be like that. But for that reason, it is exactly important to have a framework which guides from the outset different communities, the technical community, as it had been established already in parts uh, in terms of standards through the IEEE, but all the different stakeholder groups, and they coming together. This is, for me, the only way, having a human rights-based approach and an ethical framework together to guide also and to be ahead of this technology, and I think it, it addresses a number of questions raised. Sorry, I'll just be very quick, but I think there is the definite gap between technology and policy, and um, yeah, I think surveillance is, is a huge problem, and especially facial recognition, and um, yeah, we're talking about it now, and it's being rolled out very quickly. So um, in South Africa, when they're rolling out uh, fiber, the internet connectivity, they're rolling out surveillance, we want to have um, facial recognition machine learning in the cameras in the city of Johannesburg. We've got them on major campuses and um, in police cars all in one year. So um, I think to, yeah, I, I think it's unrealistic to say we can ban facial recognition, but I think at, at least there's a, a, we should push back very rapidly and perhaps some kind of moratorium on facial recognition. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks. I'd like to respond to the gentleman over here who especially, I fully agree with you on uh, data sovereignty and network sovereignty, and this is especially important for African economies, and which is why we saw in the last ministerial of the WTO, it was Africa Group that actually uh, helped stop uh, a 
terrible uh, e-commerce agreement through the WTO that would have eroded uh, data and network sovereignty rights uh, through the WTO. So I think absolutely that is important to center every time we talk about AI just because there is no national capacity at the moment to hold data or to regulate doesn't mean there cannot be in the future and those rights need to be protected. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have exhausted our time, but I don't know if our other speakers want to offer some tweets. So just very brief, I mean, I think this relationship between technology and policy is so important. There have been plenty of papers written, I just want to recommend Drexler and Kostakis, that also sees law as a catechon, basically a limiter two new developments, and that we should also not forget. The other thing about uh, elections and technology, I mean, I think we always have the problem that uh, the, of, of the, uh, the elections being kind of like the celebration of democracy, so that, it, that all the issues that we have with technology in our everyday life also come to play at election and also vice versa. So we need to take into account that the 51% challenge, right? So that with data, if we have the wrong data, it might dominate uh, all the minorities and all the issues that we have around that. And that we know is a problem of democracy. So we really need to protect and we need to take really into account how can we make AI represent the whole of the world. Thank you. Super easy. Um, Dr. Shang, you want to add something or it's okay? Very two short tweets. But there. Uh, it's not tech for social goods, and it's not technology decide everything, but so we, but people. Thank you, Cheng Hong. You want uh, easy? Um, I feel like the policy would be helpful if it was trying to move the AI and all the algorithms from the private sector to AI for good, because then it won't be like the surveillance issue. It won't be doing it like, to harm people or to infringe on their rights. It'll be for their safety. Thank you. Chen Hong, you have 20 seconds. Yeah, just to pick on un an unanswered question about uh, the open data. Yes, the, it's, it means the a gap of knowledge and research among countries. That's why UNESCO has been standing very strong to promote open access to scientific uh, technology and, uh, and research resources that can help to merge these gaps. Thank you. I'm already seeing the panelists of the next session here, but if you have a very quick tweet, please. Thank you. Sorry. Um, very interesting s session, and uh, I'm aware that the focus of the session is on discussing policy questions, and I have a sense that we all sharing similar concerns and worried about the same things. And perhaps a friendly criticism is that it would have been very interesting to hear the views of the, those who actually developed the tools on policy framework, and, and how, what is their vision of what we are discussing here. Um, I, I came in late, so perhaps I missed that bit. It was here in the room, but it would have been very interesting to see the linkages. Thank you, but Thank very you. interesting. Thank <laughs> you. I guess in the publication we have some of those thoughts. So the publication we launched in the very uh, beginning of this session, but obviously we need to keep uh, fostering and enhancing this discussion. Um, a final uh, announcement. Many of the things we have discussed here today uh, we, we, UNESCO, the SDG Academy, and the NIC.br, CETIC.br, have developed a massive online course called Tech for Good in the ICTs and SDGs. Uh, there, back at the end of the, the table, perhaps, Alexander, Fabio, you can, uh, they are the people involved in producing this 10-week course that it's available now and open in this very moment in English, Spanish, and very soon in Portuguese and Russian. So if you are interested, you can still enroll and you can see with Alexander and Fabio uh, at the end the, of the session how to do it. But uh, more in this very moment, we have almost 2,000 people from 100 in 20, uh, 34 countries enrolled in this course, so perhaps can help you to keep the discussion and the ball rolling. Thanks a lot. Uh, it was a pleasure. A round of applause to our panelists and discussants. <laughs> and you, we see you around in IGF. Thanks. Enjoy your day. <laughs>